Most breaches are caused by exploiting oversights and basic cybersecurity fundamentals, but complex hybrid multi-cloud infrastructures make cybersecurity hygiene challenging. Red Seal can help. It shows you what's on your network, how it's connected, and the associated risk across public cloud, private cloud, and physical environments. With Red Seal, you'll get control of your cybersecurity fundamentals so you can protect your organization from the inevitable attack vectors and reduce your cyber risk. For more information, visit securityweekly.com forward slash Red Seal. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome back, everyone, to Business Security Weekly. Just a reminder, our next webcast is this week, February 13th, with Sri Sundaralingam. That's right. He is the Vice President of uh, Product and Solutions Marketing at ExtraHop. We're going to talk about getting packets from the cloud. Uh, it's actually some relatively uh, new kind of technology, mm -hmm. uh, newer technology that it allows folks to do this uh, and bring in those packet captures into Extra Hop Solution. If you want to learn more, make sure you register by going to securityweekly.com, clicking the webcast drop down menu. Uh, I think that's the only, uh, oh no, there is another one. Of course, we're going to be at <laughs> RSA February 24th through the 28th. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC 2020. You can sponsor an interview or participate in one of our shows being recorded and broadcast live from RSA. There are still slots available. Uh, if you're attending the conference, uh, that link, securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC 2020, gets you $150 off the program. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, my ad blocker is just uh -oh. giving me all kinds of all kinds of issues. That's <laughs> why I was like caught off guard at the top of this segment. I was trying to load our first article here, Jason, um, that I had in my list, yeah. which was um, five things successful people don't care about. Now, what I thought was interesting was um, it, it was a good list, but mm -hmm. I also think these are things to instill in your team. Sure. 100%. And make them understand what they should. Well, achieve. I mean, you know. If successful people, I mean, your team is also You want your team your, to be successful, right? Successful so as well. I, I, I'm, um, a, I'm a firm believer in leading by example, mm -hmm. right? So obviously there's the things that you want to make sure that you're embodying, right, in the day-to-day. -day, so that way your team can take on those same type of uh, personality traits, right? Yes, absolutely. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I love this article, right? So number one was what others think they should do. Right. So great leaders don't necessarily always care what others think they should be doing. Right. They know the outcome they want. They know the mission that they need to achieve. Right. Mm -hmm. they, they've pretty much laid out a plan to get there. Uh, while feedback is great, you don't 100 percent always have to take those things into context. Right. And, and right. have them have you stray from your strategy. Right. Yep. Uh, also grandiose plans, yeah. which I'm, I'm guilty of sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, I think sharing your vision is one thing, sure. but you can't. You don't want to lose sight of mm -hmm. the tactical aspects of things, right? Agreed. You want to keep yourself in your teams, yep. Uh, yep. which I'm extending this article into. Yeah. Keep it tactical, yep. right? Yep. Share your vision. Communicate your vision, mm -hmm. right? But don't necessarily always be talking about sure. grandiose Agreed. plans Agreed. all the and, time, and, right? And, what know, can we do now? What, what can we do today? Knowing right. the vision, what can we do today to have objectives that support that yeah, goal and, rather than just kind of talking about and a lot of times plans. when folks come with you you know come to you as a leader with with these grandiose plans mm -hmm. you know you have to take a look at them and say how much they add value to the mission yes how much they add value to the outcome and and at the end of the day if they do add value and you can fit that into your plan that's great right but how many times are we going to see that right you know one out of a hundred maybe yep. so so at the end of the day yeah take a look at it see if it adds value if it doesn't add value you can get to that later right i think it's mission goals and objectives 100%. right it's something that i've started to try and do mm -hmm. more formally at the start of every year especially yeah. is reinforce the mission which you mm -hmm. should be doing all the time what is the mission of our organization yep. then what are our, our goals maybe for yep. the longer term year or or so maybe share some mm -hmm. you know further out that support the mission and then for the shorter term goals what are what are the objectives yeah, and, and, and we, that, we, well like michael's talking about we're very kind of linear in the way we think it's 100 percent right and i was just going to so, reference that right? it's orientation it, it, we, yes. every once in a while we have to reorient right mm -hmm. and take a look at things and say hey wait a minute what we're doing is adding value to the mission 
adding value to the vision of this organization and where we want to be. Yep. And if it doesn't, you kind of have to put it aside, right? You yes. really do and say, maybe next year when, when we've re reevaluated our business plan, reevaluated our mission, then we can take a look at it. But right now, it doesn't. it's not going to add value to what we're doing. And this next one, I think, segues into one of your articles, mm -hmm. and that's um, successful people don't care about being right all the time. It's, yeah, right? 100%. Failure is part of it, and I think that was one of your yeah, yeah. And your that's, that's a huge well. part, right? And, and, and if you're surrounding yourself with the best people possible, which every leader should do, you're not always going to be correct. You're going to have folks on your team who give you a different perspective, right? If you have the right amount of diversity on your team and, and the right people mm -hmm. and the right seats on the bus, you're going to get challenged, right? I, mm -hmm. I, I love it when my team challenges the process or challenges something that I, that I put forward for a plan. I want that to happen. That's, that's how you get the best result is that level of diversity. So you're not always going to be right. A leader who undermines that level of diversity and value that the team brings to the table is going to lose in the end. Absolutely. At the same time, everyone needs to come out and take an action at some point. Yes. And there is always going to be a risk of failure. Of course. And you have to accept that and make it okay. It's okay. It's, it, it's part of doing True. business, right? right. And, and, and at the end of the day, if, if you're a leader who's going to make every decision for the organization, why do you have a team? Right. Why did you bring these people in, right? Uh, run, run the department yourself, right? I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, you, you're bringing people in and they, first of all, they want to add value. They right. want to have a say. They want to have a seat at the table. So, But I know, think the key to that failure aspect mm -hmm. of what we're talking about is learning to fail fast. Absolutely. Right. It's, it's fail strategically. Because <laughs> it, if it takes too long to either recognize failure or 100%. you're pushing in the wrong direction, yeah. you know, I've seen that go yep. sideways a few times in my career where yeah. it's, it's okay, we're, we're trying this, yep. but you sometimes wish that sooner you would have realized that, yeah, fail didn't work, let's mm -hmm. move on to the next thing. Let's learn yep. from that and move on. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that in one of the articles, right? Make sure you're, you're, you're failing, but you're failing in a, in a strategic fashion so mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't cripple the organization. Right, right. right. Did you have another article along those lines, or that was your article that you were talking about? So that is the article, yeah, okay. the, yeah the failure article, yep. Um, uh, speaking of <laughs> failure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Let's segue into IBM. Jason knew exactly where I was going. Right? I did, I did. <laughs> I mean, it, it, we look at the major cloud providers, right? And we look at mm -hmm. um, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, yeah. likely in that order, right? And it's not necessarily a, a technology thing. Mm. It's adoption. Yeah. It's market share. Right. Um, it, it, and, you know, Amazon has with AWS a very mm -hmm. large adoption of, of their services. Yeah. They also have probably the most services uh, available in sure. the cloud. But IBM is an organization that's lagged uh, behind. And I think their acquisition of Red Hat, which also brings mm -hmm. in OpenShift, yep. it, it's a great platform. Absolutely. Fantastic 100%. Platform. Um, but I don't believe, and this article basically calls it out, mm -hmm. and I agree, is that they haven't had the right leadership no. to drive that vision yeah. and drive that technology to solve problems for people. Right. Um, and so they replaced their uh, existing CEO mm -hmm. who had come up through kind of a, what I gather from the article, a non-technology, non-engineering background right, right. with someone who did come from a That's technology right. and engineering background, which mm -hmm. I think is a huge win for everyone who's in engineering so. today. Like any yeah. kind of engineer, I mean, you should be thrilled at this announcement yeah. because, I mean, not because they're uh, ousting a, a CEO. That happens all the time. It does. Right? But the fact that they're making this conscientious decision to go, we want a leader a going leader. to be able to drive technology, right. realizing right. they're behind yep. the market. And my understanding is he was the principal architect around that acquisition of Red Hat, right? Mm -hmm. to, yeah. to, to help build that strategy. I mean, at the end of the day, IBM's basically saying we messed up. We messed up. We didn't have yep. a cloud strategy. You know, we were still operating in the old-fashioned ways, which we've talked about a lot yep. when, you, when you get stuck. They're right? late to the party. Late they to the party. They're late to the party, right. and they're, they're making the change. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I truly believe there's enough market share to go around yep. uh, and certainly enough nuances sure. between the various platforms that mm -hmm. uh, they, they could gain some serious market share if they changed gears and became... Uh, That's right. The technology organization they're known about, mm -hmm. Watson, is a fantastic yeah. uh, technology, um, and I think it's a you know it's a marketing and positioning thing that mm -hmm. not as many organizations are using that technology because they, it just hasn't been it just promoted, hasn't been there. That's right? right. That's right. So hopefully this will be a good uh, shift. Excuse the pun uh, <laughs> for <laughs> IBM. Um, another thing I wanted to <coughs> talk about was you know I, when I thought about the traveling that that I've done mm -hmm. in in staying in hotels and such. Yeah. A lot of it when I first started traveling, I was going to security conferences, mm -hmm. right? And it was very top of mind for uh, hackers to be like, 
when we travel, there's going to be other hackers there. That's right. Therefore, we really have to work Shut hard. Shut it all down. Right? But we, knew, <laughs> but we knew that when we traveled mm-hmm. that there were eminent threats. And 100%. I think when a lot of our executives travel for like to non-hacker conferences, mm-hmm. for example, there's not that very clear line to going to a place where it's going to be eminent threats. I mean, yeah. maybe if you're going to China or you know, uh, Russia I, or whatever. I, I would right? argue that executives even going to China or Russia Probably still, still have, have that, that top lower, of mind. Right? I'm telling but you. <laughs> it was an Seen article it. basically talking about how Iranian hackers are monitoring hotels in the travel sure. uh, industry to follow targets. Mm-hmm. And if you're especially higher ranking executive, we saw Jeff Bezos, the whole thing yeah. that happened with his, his phone. I mean, there's a whole mm-hmm. backstory to that. But, uh, you know, kind of like that aside, I think it's a good time to remind uh, and have a strategy for sure. when you're traveling. Oh, because 100%. You're, you're more vulnerable when you step outside mm-hmm. the walls of your organization, when you step outside the, yeah. the walls of your home. Uh, and these are places, uh, you know, in hotels where attackers know there's likely going to be people staying there and it's yep. an opportunity yep. uh, for them. So, you know, making sure I, I've always kind of taken the extreme as many mm-hmm. hackers have. Uh, and, you know, there's a whole debate in the hacker community about, you know, burner phones and burner <laughs> laptops. Right, right. Just put that aside uh, as well. I think it really does come down to good OPSEC to, to sure. just kind of the arguments against having burner phones mm-hmm. and laptops. It does come down to having every day good OPSEC around your devices, mm-hmm. right? Uh, that is, I think, starts with a very simple thing of not connecting to the infrastructure that's there <laughs> and having your own. Now, th- that, too, is susceptible. Yeah. Sure. I mean, no one is, uh, you know, impenetrable regardless mm-hmm. of what communication mechanism you're using. But I would say you put yourself in a better position if your Wi-Fi, mm-hmm. Bluetooth things are not being used when you travel yeah. and you're leaning towards that 4G, even now 5G sure. connection, yeah. um, but you still have to secure that, right? You have to make sure you're encrypting your, your traffic and your data over that. And I mean, those are really the two kind of basic yeah. things that really comes down to most threat vectors sure. when we have our executives travel, yep. make it easy for them. Like, look, don't plug any of your stuff mm-hmm. into someone else's stuff. Right. I mean, that's a very clear-cut rule. Yeah, so when you see that USB charger, <laughs> whether it's on the airplane, yeah. in the airport, or at the hotel. I actually, we were traveling this weekend in the hotel. I'm like, oh, how nice. They have USB. What? No, I'm not using right. those USB ports. I right. have my own you know, power yep. bricks or uh, USB cables that have the data pins. Sure. Uh, that aren't active. That and executives and in, in, in business professionals who travel a lot, they have this false sense of security. They do. You go to a hotel, a hotel you expect to be protected. Right. Right? You go to a restaurant, you expect to be protected while you're on their, their Wi-Fi or a coffee shop or something right. of that nature, right? But it's I, those, I, I mean, you were former, you know, oh, not former Marine. Marines are always Marines, <laughs> right? Um, but having come from that background, uh-huh. you know that very clear, simple procedures 100%. is one of the things that makes your mission and mm-hmm. your objective. And we talked about or, situational awareness yeah. too, right? Making sure that those travelers have situational awareness because sometimes it's not always just the technology. It could be social engineering. Absolutely. Warn your executives, you know, if, if they see certain things, hear certain things, get contacted by certain people, mm-hmm. it could be some type of an attempt to social engineer them as but well. Those clear cut rules, yep. don't plug your stuff into right. other stuff. So That's when right. they get to the hotel room, they go, oh, I remember now, IT told me not to plug mm-hmm. my stuff into any other stuff. That's that right. includes USB, that includes anything else. But also what is just as important is give them a solution that they can lean on. Yes. Don't just tell them not to. Give tell them, them the what USB, they need to do right, the USB, to accomplish the goal uh, that they need. Right? Data blockers. Because if right? they, that's right. Because if they don't have the tool, they're going to go mm-hmm. plug some <laughs> plug in somewhere. Exactly. So you have to give them the tools to be able to get beyond that. Right. Make those charging cables. That's right. Really. And, and that's just one kind of small example. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you extrapolate that out to uh, having a program where yeah. if you have people who are traveling, especially often arming them with the right cables and Here's your travel the, all of the right things, your travel kit. process That's and right. tools to be yep. able to not be as susceptible. No That's one's right. going to be impenetrable. When desperate you times, desperate measures, right? Yeah. So if they don't have what they need, they're going to go They're going to connect to that Wi-Fi That's if they don't That's have it. the you know ability to tether their phone easily. You got it. Things got like it. that. So. Um, what else do we want to talk about? Yeah, so so I had one. Um, it, it, it's it's important. It's for, it's for customer service, right? So... You know, security teams have always had that stigma of being a roadblock and not an enabler within the organization. So I thought this one was very important for security leaders and, and, and folks who are interacting with the business. And, and it's titled, the answer is yes. Now what's your question, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's by a, actually a customer experience guru. And if anybody hasn't, you know, if you haven't read anything by Mika Solomon, go, go read it. Mm-hmm. Listen to a podcast, something like that, right? He uses something called an automatic positivity. 
And, and basically, it's an approach that says, how can we get to that best measure of saying yes, right, instead of saying no? Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a business unit or a leader looking for a certain outcome. And you know, you know, you know technically or, or tactically or strategically, you're not going to be able to you know, get to that outcome in the way that they're looking for. Mm-hmm. How can you have that conversation where you're not saying no, but you're saying, here's another option. Here's a different way to look at it. Here's, here's a way we can get you to this outcome, but maybe right. not necessarily on the street, you know, going down the street that you're looking at. So, you know, it, it's, it's how can you build that level of positivity so they're not looking at security as a roadblock, the security mm-hmm. team as a roadblock or an impediment to do business, right? I always say, I, w- I want to be an enabler of the business. But I need to be able to mitigate risk at the same time. Mm-hmm. So let's figure out a solution that works for everybody uh, right. you know, when, you, when you're looking at it. So the article actually gives you um, different techniques you can use to, to, to be able to have that uh, different level of a conversation. Words matter, right? When you come out and you say, no, that's we can't, true. no, you shouldn't, you shall not do this, mm-hmm. that's, that's abrasive, right? Um, how can we kind of change that, flip the script on that, and, and, and have us be more of an enabler to the business and get people to those outcomes? Yeah, I think that greatly helps to reduce friction Mm -hmm. in a situation where friction is highly likely. Yeah. I think you also need some of that other training where you do that and it, there's still a lot of friction. Yeah. And we've all been in the, sure. many of us, right, have probably worked in a yeah. call center and customer mm-hmm. support right. where you know that sometimes there's always that 5 mm-hmm. to 10% of the time. Absolutely. Just, oh, and that's, I think, you get a different lesson. That sounds like sure. you have some resources to, yeah, yeah. to deal with. But yep. if you can uh, basically wipe out a lot of that friction at the get-go yeah, you're not right. in that situation where it, you're constantly backpedaling and dealing with sure. it and there may be part. situations where you you just absolutely can't get to the outcome yeah but how do we get as close to that outcome as possible right mm-hmm. so it's it's saying no without saying no i guess right yep. so so you know, like i said words matter so saying something like i'm afraid we can't accommodate that request that's hard and fast yeah you can say things like I know we can't get to the outcome you're looking for, but how can we get you as close to that as possible? Let's, you know, yeah. in the instance of like recovery, right? I mean, I know some stories of folks who've been out there, you know, their their laptop completely died on them. They, you know, they got hit with ransomware, whatever the yeah. case may be. We can't recover it, right? At the mm-hmm. end of the day, it's, it's, it's one machine versus, you know, 1,400 machines within our organization. But how can we get you as close to that level of recovery as possible, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, it's just those level of, that level of customer service that I think would benefit our teams to be able to have positive conversations versus the hard and fast friction. Right. Yeah, because I think great organizations all have uh, great customer uh, success programs mm-hmm, 100%. but that doesn't mean that 100 percent of the time they're making everyone 100 percent happy no. it's all about the way they go about it that is right? it is yeah. it's about the delivery at the end of the mm-hmm. day yeah agreed yep so another article that i that i really really liked um it's called when you lead a company or startup creating a culture um is, is really the most important thing right so um you look at it like uh, entrepreneurs and business leaders they really uh they really dictate the behaviors of their organization, right? Uh, I said earlier, lead by example. So they're the ones going out there and, and, and making sure that the values are formed, right? So um, a- as a leader, I think you know, we need to take a step back and say, how do we get folks to follow suit with a culture? And how do I lead that culture so our organization can be successful? You know, it, it's so important um, that, that, that leaders can actually build that level of culture um, and a strong culture within an organization, because again, they, I, I think sometimes they don't realize how much influence they really do have across the entire organization. One of the best examples of this is, um, I don't know if you listened to the Doug Song interview mm-hmm. that I did on Paul Security Weekly. When I asked Doug about the customer-focused culture that they yeah. built at, at Duo, he didn't talk about how he was um, you know, coaching his employees to have better customer service. Mm-hmm. If you listen closely, what Doug essentially said was, we treat our employees very well, yep. and therefore that extends out into our customers. That's we key. build a culture of helping people. Mm-hmm. It starts with our employees. Yeah. And then just by like nature taking its course, right. we've got great customer service, and right? I key. mean, that's kind of what that was the essence of that's his right. answer that's for right. that, right? right. And, and, and when you say, you know, a lot of or- the best organizations have this customer success program, mm-hmm. well, those organizations also have an employee success, success program, program <laughs> at the yeah. end of the day, yeah. because they realize when the rubber hits the mode, it's the road, that employee is the one interfacing with yes. those customers yes. and they're representing the organization, right? And, and the article goes through a lot of the things we normally talk about, right? Like, you know, share your values, mm-hmm. um, build a high performance culture, give credit where credit's due, but there's a few of them that I pulled out here that I thought were really, really good. Um, one of them is no excuses culture. 
build a culture where employees don't have to worry about bringing excuses if failure happens, right? We right. talked about failure being a part of doing business. Um, create an environment <laughs> where, you know, it's not about excuses. Don't let excuses become habitual. Make sure you're having those real conversations and you're really talking about um, issues that you may have had, failures that may have had, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, allow for employees to be open and transparent, you know, and have that you level of integrity in the conversations. It's interesting. There was, uh, I was actually thinking about it uh, the past week or so that there are a few people, and you, we all have these, right? A few mm -hmm. people in your life, in, in your career that have just had this like one thing that you remember that yep. they instilled upon you. And to this, uh, to this uh, notion, mm -hmm. right? My high school dean yeah. had a giant printout in hanging above his, in his office yep. above his desk, yep. and it said "no excuses." I love it. It's all it said. Two words. It. Two That's words it. out of the English language. Right. And to this day, I still remember that and, and embody that. And it's really funny that it crops up quite often, actually, a in lot. our leadership. One hundred percent. Right. Because that, I, but to have, you know, go back in your life and those people mm -hmm. that have had those good lessons. Yeah. And you can build those together. And when you create a team or a company or uh, are, are embarking on a, a new journey in any capacity, yeah. remembering those lessons from people, oh, I think is really important. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, making excuses is just a waste of time, right? Mm -hmm. You're wasting people's time. You're eroding integrity. You're eroding trust, right? You're, you're creating a culture that's not accountable, right, for certain yep. things. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I'm reading right, right now, one of the books that I'm reading is, is uh, Call Sign Chaos mm -hmm. by Jim Madison. Jim Mattis. He was the Secretary of Defense. He ran CENTCOM, mm -hmm. Marine. Um, you know, and there's one, one line in that book that I love. And it says, you make mistakes in life and you get knocked down. You have to get up and deal with it. Don't whine about it. Right? Deal with it. Head right. on. You made a mistake. Admit it. Have that level of integrity and, and then come up with a plan on how you're going to remediate that or, or mm -hmm. you know, get back up and, and get to it. It's awesome. Yeah. Do you have other uh, articles that we hadn't covered yet? Oh, uh, 11 books that will change the way you think about leadership. Yes. Wow. So, the, you know. Uh, is this your list? I want to see Jason's 11 books. Oh, I'll, I'll I make that list. I'll <laughs> make that list, right? So this is one that I just picked up simply because even if you consider yourself a natural leader, right? You've been in a leadership position for a while. Um, I, I truly believe that you always have to stay educated, right? You always have to be learning new tech techniques, uh, new leadership skills in order to be mm -hmm. able to do a great job all the time, right? Uh, you can't become complacent, I guess, is, is, is the key to that, right? So I, out of this list, I pulled a few books out that I wanted to see in my book list, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add them to my audio books, and these are the ones that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip through over the course of 2020. And, and two of them have to do with something that I want to get better at. Um, which is emotional intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. um, one's called Radical Candor, Be a Kick-Ass Boss Without Losing Your human Humanity. It's by Kim Scott. Um, you know, for, for me, uh, I look at this and I say, how can I build better relationships with my staff? How can I be a little bit more empathetic? How can I build more trust, deeper levels of trust? And for me, that's, that's really that emotional intelligence side, mm -hmm. really connecting with staff. So that way you can motivate staff better you know the different you know techniques because everybody's different on the team yeah. one motivation for paul is going to be a different motivation for jason right mm -hmm. so by better understanding and having that deeper level of emotional intelligence it's going to allow me to um, adapt in the way that i lead with all of my team right mm -hmm. uh, the other one is the same way it's called the empathy edge uh, harnessing value of compassion as an engine for success same idea how do you how do you make those deeper connections with staff so you can learn more about them in turn, being able to motivate them better and, and Chris have Boss's better book, uh does a great job on the empathy part of it. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, what was that book called? Crap, we talked about it on the show. Mm. It's about negotiation. He was the FBI. Oh, the negotiator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Have you yep. read his book? I haven't read that one. No, I haven't. Great. Uh, empathy is really yeah a big uh, piece. A of big it. piece. Uh, it is. It's it. how you make connections, now, right? Simon Sinek. Yes. Is that your third? Is that your third one? Is that, that on is a list? third one? Yep. Because I, I don't know if it was you. Or maybe Michael, but I've I've heard this name. Simon the Simon name, Sinek. Sinek. I it's it a, maybe Michael may have as well, but yeah. there, there's a lot of books by Simon Sinek that I've read. Yep. Um, uh, Why leaders eat last was one I brought yeah, up on the okay. show. Okay. Uh, but this is this is a new one, The Infinite Game, right? And this is more about motivations. You know, traditional ways say like you know sales teams you offer compensation for them selling more, but he goes in and explores how you can, you know, continually motivate folks without having to dangle the carrot. Uh, and right, I, and I I'm a that. firm believer in that, honestly. I am too, because I've noticed that when I've done that style of motivation, yeah. it's not 
not i mean it's it's somewhat effective but not the level that i want it but to it's be. the law of unintended consequences right mm -hmm. when 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 you give some level of compensation you may create a habit that really could sideline the business right Agreed. depending on it yep. depending on what that motivation is now your employees just focused on getting to that point how do i put more money in my pocket right mm -hmm. by making sure i meet this metric or this sales goal but they may not be strategically selling, let's say if they're a salesperson, yeah. or they may not be strategically helping the organization because they're just focused on getting more money in their pocket. This is, this is how do you create an environment where there's really no, there's no end in sight. It's that continuous motivation, yeah. that continuous, I want to be here, I want to work hard, I want to be motivated to make this company better. So this is one I want to really, really get awesome. deep into. I know, um, I've kind of taken a break from the leadership uh, mm. books, uh, and I'm reading mostly... Uh, books about hackers and such, yep, yep. Uh, and I've really gone down that that. And again, sure, I think sure. the the one that has stood out the best for me um, is uh, Sandworm by Andy Greenberg. Mm. Really, really good book. Yeah, I really like that. I'm gonna one. add that to my list. Yeah, because I'll, I'll say I've I've gone down the rabbit hole of just wanting to study leadership more and more. Yeah, which has kind of pulled me away from the technical technical right. reading a lot. Yeah. So so I think something like that will, will kind this of help guide me This was a good balance back. of explaining <laughs> things, um, having a little bit of a story, mm -hmm. it, and it was better than some of the other ones sure. that I had started reading or even uh, finished on my list. Um, this one was was yeah, really good. Yeah. Was really good. But Simon Sinek, I mean, grab grab some of his books. Yeah, that's that's something I'll really recommend for for anybody you know watching the show. Any any of the audience, um, you want to fine tune those leadership skills. He's got an incredible set of books to to read. Outstanding. Right. Well, Jason, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for listening, watching this edition of Business Security Weekly. We'll see you next time.